today our lead pastor, Katie Nix, is attending the Missouri Annual Conference session of the United Methodist Church. This is the first time in three years that the clergy and the laity have been able to meet face to face to celebrate and to confirm who we are as United Methodists. Our deacon, Perrin Crouch, is also in Branston, where she is going to be commissioned as a deacon in the United Methodist Church. This is a very big moment for her, therefore it's a big moment for us as well. Katie is ordained an elder in the United Methodist language, which makes her a generalist appointed year by year to a local congregation. Perrin, as a deacon, is a specialist under the employment of a congregation. In this case, she is our director of community engagement. And so without Katie and Perrin, here we are. This is Sarah's third Sunday leading our music ministry. This is my first time of standing here before you. All you need to know are in the few sentences in the bulletin. This could be the first Sunday for a few of you attending Grace United Methodist Church. Others of you have been here for a while and you've been trying to hold things together during the pandemic and to build a strong and coherent ministry after the merger last year of University Church and Grace Church. And then some of you have been committed here for decades in the midst of all the ongoing changes that have challenged us to find ways to move forward and to embrace the purpose of Jesus Christ. So we've gathered together and we are Grace United Methodist Church. So good morning, church. <laughs> the invitation is given to every person by Jesus Christ, come to follow me, follow me, be my disciples. We come to this place in this um, the invitation of Jesus Christ. In the name of Christ, uh, in the name of Christ, uh, in the midst of a world where cruelty abounds, in the midst of despair that threatens to swallow up whole lives, whole peoples, In the midst of indifference and apathy, proclaim the God. Come, let us worship together and share our witness of God's living presence in the world. I invite you to stand for our opening hymn.
may be seated. We enter into a prayer, both spoken and sung, and the part that we are singing is a hymn by Charles Wesley called, And Are We Yet Alive? It's not a real familiar one for us. Sometimes it's a few verses hard to sing, but this was the hymn that the Methodist itinerant lay preachers would sing every year when they were called back into an annual conference. Don't know if they still sing it in Missouri, but it is part of our tradition. So we will sing it with the verses separated by uh, prayer spoken by me and by us. So let us begin with the first verse of the hymn. Lord our God, we thank you for the many people who have followed your way of life joyfully, for the many saints and martyrs, men and women who have offered up their very lives so that your life abundant may become manifest and your kingdom may advance. They chose the way of your Son, our brother Jesus Christ. In the midst of trial, they held out hope. In the midst of persecution, they witnessed to your power. In the midst of despair, they clung to your cross. Oh Lord, we thank you for the truth they have learned and passed on to us. Give us courage to follow their way of life. For your love and faithfulness, we will at all times praise your name. Pray for the millions in our world who must go hungry today, all who are exploited and marginalized because of their caste or class, color or sex, that they may not lose their hope and may find the strength to struggle for their dignity. We call upon you for those who are persecuted, imprisoned, tortured, or threatened to death because of their weakness for justice and peace, for those who have disappeared because they dare to speak, that their spirits may not be broken by their body's pain. We remember those who live in regions torn by tension and war, by disaster, famine, and poverty. We pray for the millions of refugees around the world that in the midst of tears and bitterness, they may discern signs of hope. Lord, into your hands we commend our earth, ever threatened with disaster, and all persons and situations we have spoken about, written down, or remembered in the silence of our hearts this day. To strengthen our will for peace and justice, increase our faith in your kingdom, where love and faithfulness will meet, 
righteousness and peace will embrace. And when your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Let's offer our prayers to God first in silence, and I'll offer prayers on our behalf, and then we will join together in our Lord's Prayer. In silence, let us pray. Dear God, how uncommon it is for us to sit in silence in a world of noise and the intrusion of constant requests. We sometimes cannot think of what we're thinking, cannot see what we're observing, cannot understand what we're thinking. And as you call us in this moment to this place to see those things, to have those thoughts, to hear ourselves speak to you. We thank you for this day and for one another that we can gather as a community and for those who have gathered with us digitally and yet are very much part of our embrace. We thank you for those who walk by this place every day, all day, maybe not even noticing, and yet they are part of our community of love. Help us to see them. Help us to understand. Help us in a city that constantly is trying to rediscover itself. Help us to provide some sort of frame of reference, some sort of intentionality that you've given us as people of faith. We thank you for all your gifts, especially for the gift of life itself, that we are able to be here, be with one another, and be aware of your love. Forgive us in those times that we forget. Knowing that you have given us a heritage which we embrace, we now pray together the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. affirm our faith together. We believe in God above us, creator of all things, the center of all life. We believe in Christ beside us, companion and friend, redeemer of all the broken pieces of our universe. We believe in spirit deep within us. And 
We believe in God's resurrection created world. Where all things are fixed and all creation fits together in vibrant harmonies. We believe in God above, beside, within. God yesterday, today, and forever. The three in one, the one in three. We believe in God. I invite all the little ones to come up here and have a seat. We're going to have children's message now. <laughs> yeah, come on. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Oops, are you okay? Well, good morning, guys. How are you? Good. As you may have noticed, Pastor Perrin and Pastor Katie aren't here. Uh-oh. Looks like I'm going to have to be in charge today. <laughs> okay, that's much better. So, what are some things that uh, pastors do? Go on business trips. What else do pastors do? <laughs> Give sermons and make up sermons every week. Anybody else? Yeah, what do they do? They tell people about God and how to live like a godly life. Yeah. Becca, what do pastors do, Becca? Do you know? No. <laughs> yes, what else do they do? Spoil the children. Spoil the children. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. That sounds like a, uh, too much for me. I'm going to have to take this off. <laughs> Woo, that's a lot. <laughs> I'm not the pastor anyway. But yeah, so... Um, where are they? Do you guys know where they are? Where are they? They're at Branson doing a business trip. That business trip is called Annual Conference. And so all the pastors, there's 900 of them in Missouri. And they're all getting together in one place to talk about really big important things for the Methodist congregation. And so that's a lot to talk about. And people there will get ordained as pastors or they'll become deacons. And it's, it's a place to celebrate uh, who the pastors are. So that's pretty cool. Um, so what type of things should we be doing for those pastors in Branson right now? What do you think we should be doing? Yes. Okay, she said praying for them so that when they're doing conference, people don't get angry. They use kind words. What else could they, we pray about for them? What's that? I can't hear you. What specific things should we pray about for them, you think? Safe travels. Okay, yeah, so that Pastor Perrin and Pastor Katie come back safe. That's nice. Well, how about we do that? Okay, we'll lift them up in prayer. Can you guys fold your hands and we'll say a little prayer? You repeat after me, okay? Dear God, thank you for our pastors. Thank you for all that they do making sermons. We pray that they make good decisions at annual conference. 
and bring them home safe. In Jesus' name. Can we go one, two, three? Amen. All right, guys. Have fun at Children's Church. The scripture this week is Romans 5, 1 through 5, and John chapter 16, 12 through 15, as can be read in the message translation. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him, make us fit for him, we have it all together with God because of our Master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that He has already thrown open His door to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory standing tall and shouting our praise. There's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we are hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we are never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't handle them now. But when the friend comes, the Spirit of Truth, he will take you by the hand and guide you into all the truth there is. He won't draw attention to himself, but will make sense out of what is about to happen, and indeed, out of all that I have done and said. He will honor me. He will take from me and deliver it to you. Everything the Father has is also mine. That is why I've said, he takes from me and delivers to you. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. The many gifts that we bring to the altar, certainly our presence, our faith, and now in real terms, other presents that support the ministry of this church. And while those are collected, we will be receiving the gift of the music of the choir. Yeah. 
Dear God, we thank you for all the gifts you give us, that we might in turn be generous with others. Bless these gifts that are obvious and bless so many that are hidden and yet essential to your work in this place at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Who are we is a valid question to be asking ourselves these days. I mean, here we are as a church reimagining ourselves by merging University Church and Grace Church to become something new. And then working our way through the pandemic, struggling with uncertain economy, trying to survive a divisive political culture, hearing of invasions over there and hoping for disarming ourselves at home. Who are we at a time like this? We need to hear what Jesus said to the disciples on that night before he was crucified. He said, this is a time of dramatic change. And you're not going to be able to understand it all right now. But don't worry, he says. The Holy Spirit will reveal new truths to you as you move into the future. For now, you know enough to carry on. You know who you are and what you are to do. So go and share God's love with the world and the Holy Spirit will lead you along the way. Today is Trinity Sunday on the church calendar, celebration of the Holy Spirit. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. In the midst of constant change, the Holy Spirit reminds us of who we are. And we know who we are. We are Grace United Methodist Church. And in that name, we are saying a lot. We are Methodist. Methodism did not start out as a separate denomination. Rather, John Wesley started a renewal movement within the Church of England, the Anglican Church, Because in Wesley's day, 1730s in England, the church had become stagnant. Every citizen by default was a member, except for a few Baptists and Congregationalists lying low and some Catholics mumbling quietly and Latin off to the side. But John, even as a student at Oxford, saw that the Anglican church was not living up to the gospel. So he called together his fellow students to meet in his room at five o'clock in the morning to study the Bible together, to pray, to sing hymns, and then to go out and visit the inmates at the local prison. Now, just imagine living in the room next to John Wesley. (laughs) It proved to be so irritating that the other students began to ridicule these enthusiasts and call them Methodists. Originally, it was a term of derision. Nevertheless, John Wesley went on to be ordained as an Anglican priest, and for his entire life, he stayed in Anglican. All the Methodists were Anglican in those days, but he still was convinced that God's love was for everyone equally, not just the 5% who could afford to buy a pew at the parish church or to take off one work day a week for worship. God's grace is for everyone. And that got John Wesley into trouble with the Bishop of Bristol, who refused to appoint Wesley to a parish. 
John's theology was too inclusive for the bishop. It, it was too liberal in that sense. And so not getting a parish appointment, Wesley turned a necessity into a virtue by declaring, the world is my parish. And for the next 50 years, he rode 250,000 miles on horseback. Throughout the week, preaching to the other 95% who couldn't make it to the church, including miners in the open pits of Cornwall, the weavers outside the mills in Durham, the townsfolk shopping in the market square of Wolverhampton, and those living under the bridges along the Thames River. And his message was consistent. By God's grace, you are loved. You cannot earn God's love because it has been given to you. So now get on with sharing it with others. Now that did not, that did not please everyone. Certainly not the 5%. The Countess of Huntington was one of the few wealthy followers of John Wesley, and she tried to persuade the Duchess of Buckingham to think favorably of the Methodists. The Duchess wrote back to the Countess, I thank your ladyship for the information concerning the Methodist preachers. Their doctrines are most repulsive and strongly tinctured with impertinence and disrespect toward their superiors in perpetually endeavoring to level all ranks and do away with all distinctions. It's monstrous to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that crawl the earth. <laughs> now, sometimes the truth of God's inclusive grace is repulsive. But Wesley continued his itinerant ministry in spite of derision and opposition, and he convinced hundreds and hundreds of lay preachers to go out into the countryside as well with the good news of God's gracious love. And then once a year, he called them all back together to an annual conference. And this is when they sang, and are we yet alive and see each other's face? Glory and thanks to Jesus give for his almighty grace. And then seeing each other face to face, they shared their stories. What troubles we have seen. What mighty conflicts past. Fightings within and fears without since we assembled last. And then together they declared, Yet out of all the Lord hath brought us by his love. Those are the words we sang earlier. And those words were written not by John Wesley, but by the other Wesley, Charles, the poet, John's younger brother. While John Wesley rode the countryside on horseback, Charles eventually settled down in Bristol with his family and wrote poems, intended to be sung to any tune that would work including those borrowed from the local pub. It said that Charles Wesley wrote 6,500 hymn texts and that 5,500 of them are not any good. <laughs> but that leaves him with 1,000, which puts him 998 ahead of Martin Luther. So today, Christians of every sort sing Charles' hymns many more than who quote John's sermons. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hark the herald angels sing. Come the long expected Jesus. Love divine, all love's excelling. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. He wrote the words this morning to the prelude that you heard played, and can it be? And then the choral anthem, what shall I render to my God? And our closing hymn, Jesus united by thy grace. John and Charles Wesley, founders of a renewal movement within the established church based on the inclusive love of God. That's who we are. Methodist, as in Grace United Methodist Church. Now already we have suggested for the Wesleys that grace is the, at the heart of God's gift to us. And, 
Grace is sort of an imprecise word as we use it in our own language. But our congregation has defined it and put it on the website. Look it up. Grace, noun, the exercise of love, kindness, mercy, favor, disposition to benefit or serve another. The big transformation in John Wesley's religious life came when he realized that he had Christianity backward. He had the gospel wrong. I mean, here he was in his mid-30s, already an ordained minister in the Church of England, having failed as a missionary in the New World in Georgia, and still trying methodically to make everything right with the world. Why? So that he could earn God's grace to be accepted by God's love. He thought, as so many people did then and so many people do today, that if you do all the right things, pray regularly, go to church, read the Bible, give money to fix the organ, bring a casserole to the church supper, God will reward you with salvation. John thought he had to earn his way into heaven. And then one night, May 24th, 1738, at a Bible study group on Aldersgate Street in London, while somebody was reading a treatise written by Martin Luther, <coughs> it dawned on John that we can't earn God's love because it's already been given to us. It's the gift of God's grace. So we don't need to do all the right things in order to win God's love. God loves us first so that we might do all the right things. Wesley came up with a kind of painful terminology for this. He talked about prevenient grace, prevenient, that which comes before we even know it, while we were yet sinners, says the gospel. <clears throat> when we know of God's unearned love revealed to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we then experience justifying grace. That is, we don't have to justify ourselves to God or to anybody that's already been taken care of. But then, Wesley said, it's our call to move toward sanctifying grace, to put God's love into action day by day. Wesley labeled this as going on to perfection, and he said, we'll never get there. But we ought to be a more mature Christian now than we were 10 years ago. We need constantly to be moving from separation toward reconciliation. So grace is at the heart of the matter. That's who we are, Grace United Methodist Church. But Briefly, let's acknowledge that problematic word in between grace and Methodist, <laughs> united. I'm not a good typist, and so over the years, I've often tried to type united and ended up with untied. <laughs> and right now, the United Methodist Church, <clears throat> which has a worldwide reach, <clears throat> is becoming untied. There are several congregations, including some here in Missouri, who are choosing to become independent or part of some other version of Methodism. It will be interesting to hear from Katie and Perrin what they learned at the annual conference session. But the current split now began about 50 years ago around issues of inclusion, who's in and who's out. But Grace United Methodist Church already has declared its devotion to the graceful ministry of reconciliation. It's on our website. <clears throat> we acknowledge the blessed gift of diversity in our community and the world. This includes all ages, races, ethnicities, nationalities, faith, traditions, sexual orientations, gender identities, family configurations, economic statuses, and mental and physical abilities. And that just about covers it. Though I wonder about Cubs fans. 
the Methodists had to untie themselves from the Church of England right after the Revolutionary War when the Anglicans went home. And Methodists in the States split north and south in the 1840s over slavery, and we did not reunite until 1939, a hundred years later. And during that time, major black Methodist denominations formed independently out of necessity. The African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME Zion Church, Colored Methodist Episcopal Church. And it wasn't until 1968 that the black congregations within the Methodist Church formally reunited. Of significance, because it was of no significance whatever when the two churches merged last year, is that University Church had been Methodist Church South, and Grace Church had been Methodist Church North. And the fact that it didn't matter, that it was not part of the discussion, is key to how we are called constantly to move forward, uniting and untying and reuniting it's part of our history, as well as it is part of almost all major Christian bodies of the world. <clears throat> so we are Grace United Methodist. And that brings us to the last word, maybe the hardest of all, church. We are Grace United Methodist Church. <clears throat> and what does it mean to be the church at this time, in this place? to be a congregation that is both community people gathering in person and as a network of people united digitally. That's our urgent agenda now. After the merger, learning from the pandemic, with new staff members, with a continuously changing neighborhood, with a desire to connect with other congregations in the metropolitan area, with students back on campus, with Delmar Avenue returning to life, and with a national crisis of disunity, what does it mean to be the church? So the sermon ends here without any further explanation because we have to write that part together. Our work is to consider what it means to be Grace United Methodist Church. As Jesus told the disciples on the night before his death, not everything has been revealed to us. The work of God's love is forever evolving, and we need to change with it. But fear not. God has given us the grace to do it. We know who we are. Amen. We will sing together a song obviously chosen because it says what it says by Charles Wesley, Jesus, united by thy grace. Let's stand and sing together as we're able. <coughs>
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Go in peace, and may the peace of God go with you. Amen. Amen.